future at UMBC. State Circle is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Connecting Marylanders to their government. This is State Circle. Good evening, welcome to State Circle. Coming up tonight, what type of coronavirus test do you need and mistakes to avoid when voting by mail? That's coming up. We begin with the latest on Maryland's battle with the coronavirus. The state's death toll from the disease has passed 2,000. 300 people lost their lives in the last week. That compares to 339 the previous week. The number of patients in intensive care has dropped from more than 600 down to 506. The state's unemployment rate shot up to 9.9 percent due to layoffs connected to the shutdown. Official information for Marylanders can be found online at coronavirus.maryland.gov. With stay-at-home orders being gradually relaxed in many parts of the state, Ocean City is ready for a cautious kickoff to its summer season. Our Sue Copen reports. The signs are everywhere, whether you look up or down in Ocean City. You know, the summer of 2020 is going to be a little different. Ocean City Mayor Rick Meehan says the season ahead will be a challenging one. I think most people understand that individually they have to take some responsibility and they're going to have to do what they need to do to comply with social distancing and uh, actually being able to be here. For Susan Jones, executive director of the Ocean City Hotel Motel Restaurant Association, the lead up to this important time of year has been unlike any other. I have not worked harder at anything than I have at trying to make sure that we can salvage some sort of season in Ocean City. Jones says the hotels and motels have been working to make changes needed to meet safety guidelines set by the Centers for Disease Control and the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Things like their own frontline staff, you know, they're putting up the plexiglass or they're having them wear the mask and the face shield. But when it comes to completely reopening restaurants, which are still now limited to just deliveries and carryout, Joan says they're still waiting for guidance from the state. We still, to this day, don't have official restaurant guidelines. Among those waiting for guidelines is Greg Shockley, the longtime owner of Shenanigans Irish Pub on the boardwalk. Do the servers have to wear masks? Do they have to wear gloves? Can they, do they have to serve the food in a tray? Shockley says he wants to keep his staff safe and do whatever's needed to avoid a COVID-19 spike. So if they want to do it step by step, this is fine. For now, visitors to Ocean City can stroll the boardwalk, hit the beach, and order carryout. But the theme parks and mini golf courses sit quiet, but ready. We are a creative bunch of people, and we want to have a summer. With some counties' businesses open and other counties still restricted, what are residents to do if they straddle the line of two counties? That's the issue for Mount Airy, which sits on the Frederick County, Carroll County line. We couldn't have a hairstylist on one side of the street closed and one on the other side open. So we took a low profile approach. We notified our Frederick County businesses they can open in full compliance with the governor's uh, relaxations and that they were not bound by the Frederick County uh, restrictions. Again, Mount Airy is open for business, but complying with the governor's restrictions. Farm stands around the state also ready for the summer season, but with some precautions, as Nancy Yamato reports. We're averaging between 100 and 200 orders a day. Third generation farmer Tyler Butler of Butler's Orchard in Germantown says business is remarkably good, albeit different right now. The local movement has been a wonderful thing that's been happening for, for many years now, but it's really starting to take off, and especially with the coronavirus. The Butlers never imagined that in their 70th year of business, they would have to make so many changes to adjust to a pandemic. In a week and a half, they were able to create an online store and began offering curbside contactless pickup. Uh, this is my fourth time. They do it such a great job. I can order it all online. They have wonderful produce and they get it to me without having to touch anything. It's wonderful. Butler's Orchard is expanding their offerings with meat and produce like avocados and bananas. Ironically, 
You want to know our number one seller? It's going to be apple cider donuts, you know? <laughs> the donuts are a big craze. After that, it's apples that people are clamoring for. On most days, online orders are fulfilled and ready for pickup within a couple of hours. And while their grocery revenue is up compared to the same time last year. We've got to do all the shopping for you. So um, while we do see that revenue coming in, there's also a major, major amount of cost going into it as well. And like so many small businesses that are doing everything in their power to keep sales coming in. It's very calm and peaceful out here. And the folks here at Butler's Orchard are assuring its loyal customers that one time on our tradition will continue this year, and that's pick your own strawberries. It starts real soon, but with some changes this year. We're going to be able to limit how many people come in, so we're only going to sell a certain amount of tickets per, per time slot. In a time where people are craving for normal, the Butlers say they are grateful for the business and ready to face and overcome whatever challenges lie ahead. Farmers are the most patient people in the world, um, and we are the most adaptable. I'm Nancy Yamada for MPT News. Coronavirus tests are now available without a doctor's order at many locations, including certain Walmart, CVS, and Rite Aid stores. We spoke with Anne Arundel County's health officer. Dr. Kaliana Raman, thank you for being with us. What is the testing situation in your county now? Thank you for having me. So the testing situation in our county is we see that there's more and more test sites that are available now um, that are able to do the, the PCR testing. That's the swab in your nose or, your, or the back of your throat. <clears throat> now, I, uh, I've seen, most people have probably seen the video of the governor of New York getting the swab in the, you know, up the nose. Mm -hmm. uh, which looked to me to be like a yardstick up your nose, <laughs> a little daunting. What, what choices do patients have? Yeah, so, the, so the, there's the type of testing that we're usually talking about is PCR testing, where you're looking for, um, where you're looking for the, the virus and you're trying to find that there's detectable parts of it. And so you do it where it is. So that's that swab, and it actually goes all the way through your nose to the back of your throat. And that's why it looks like it's going in real deep. Um, and that kind of testing actually gives you the best chance of finding the virus. But we're finding out that you can also swab deep inside the nose. You don't have to go all the way back. Um, or you can go to the back of the throat. Some of it just depends on the test swab itself and what it's designed for. Yeah, the, the New York governor didn't flinch to, to his credit. So maybe, maybe it's not as bad as it, as it looks. How much is dependent on the, the skill of the person administering the test? Part of it is skill, um, and that really relates to which type of test. So if you got to get that swab all the way to the back of the nose, you have to have somebody who's going to be sure to do that. But also there's just a part of it that's also, uh, we know that these tests aren't perfect because if you get a spot in the nose or the back of the throat where there's just less virus, you may not catch it. So there's always what we call a, false negative rate where somebody who has it just won't test positive. We know there's some other tests out there. There's a pharmacy chain that, uh, that uh, had a press release this week about a, a drive-through testing service and it's, it's a self-administered swab. And then mm -hmm. there may be some other saliva tests. Um, in terms of relative reliability, if you, if you want to get it right, what, what's mm -hmm. your advice? So the saliva tests are the same um, it's the same PCR tests that we're talking about. Um, and they're starting to come on the market and they look real promising because they can be self-administered. And that makes it a lot easier for people. It's obviously a lot easier to spit in a cup or swab your mouth than to get a stick poked in the back of your throat. And it's looking like the reliability of those tests is actually pretty good and pretty much in line with the ones going through the nose or to the back of the throat. So as that becomes more available, we'll probably be switching to those more often, at least for the general population. Now that there, there seems to be greater availability of, of tests, who, who should get tested and has that advice you know, uh, shifted at all? Yeah, so a large part of where we started is that there weren't enough tests to test everybody who should have been tested. So we're, the changing advice really reflects our ability to test more than the criteria itself changing. But who should get tested? People who are at high risk 
So particularly people who are healthcare workers, first responders, working in uh, congregate settings like nursing homes, corrections, or homeless shelters, and then the residents of those high-risk settings as well. Uh, the second priority level uh, is anybody with symptoms at this point, and there's a range of symptoms, uh, including fever, shortness of breath, and cough that we talked about, but there's also an expanded range of symptoms, so loss of sense of taste and smell, muscle aches, fatigue, um, runny nose. These are some of the expanded symptoms that we're looking at, looking at as well. How do the, the newer uh, antibody tests fit into that and, and who needs to get one of those? The antibody tests are a big area where there's a lot of confusion. And, and the reason is that the antibody tests are meant to tell if you've been exposed to COVID. So they're not really helpful if you have symptoms right now. Um, you still need that swab uh, or the saliva, hopefully. But what we're seeing is that there's a lot of tests that have come out really quickly. The FDA has gone through an expedited process, but it means that there's a lot of variability between those tests. And I think the important thing to, to know is that when there's not a lot of virus in the community, you can get a lot of false positive tests, which means that you think you have immunity when you don't. Um, and that's just a feature of how these tests work. So there's still more work to be done on antibody testing uh, and to see when you should be using it. Well, what's the, the broader situation in Anne Arundel County in terms of uh, this outbreak, how it's affecting uh, healthcare facilities, nursing homes, hospitals? Uh, just give us a status report. Yeah. So in, in Anne Arundel County, we see that the hospitals have kind of gotten to a good level place. They have a, um, they, we, we're seeing a decrease in the number of people who are in hospital beds with COVID, although the number of people in ICU beds is holding flat and hasn't come down yet. Uh, in our nursing homes, our nursing homes, much like those around the state and the country, had a lot of trouble in the initial part of this. Uh, and I think a big part of that was PPE, there just wasn't enough. And also, not, we didn't realize that asymptomatic individuals could transmit this. And so there was a lot of transmission happening. So once, we, once those two things uh, came into place, we've seen a significant reduction in the number of cases in nursing homes, in the number of deaths in nursing homes. Uh, and I think that they're on much more stable footing at this point. How would you assess your ability uh, today to do contact tracing? The idea that somebody tests positive you figure out who they've been in contact with who may have been exposed and you advise those people to get a test or to quarantine. Um, how does your ability to actually do that uh, compare to the, the need to have that done right now? Yeah, so we've been contact tracing from, the, from day one. Um, and we've actually contact traced every single person who's been positive in the county. So over 3,100 people to date. And that contact tracing is really important, not just to provide guidance and support for the person who's positive, but to identify who they were in contact with, close contact with, who then need to go into quarantine. And that means staying away from everybody else for 14 days. And that's really the core of what contact tracing does. It gets those high-risk individuals pretty much out of the system. I like to think of it as an individual stay-at-home order so that they can't pass that on and it breaks the cycle of transmission. Very good, Dr. Nilesh Kalyanaraman. Uh, thank you for the time. Thank you so much. The spectacle of the Naval Academy Commissioning Week had its wings clipped by the pandemic, but the Blue Angels still put on a show. Annapolis area residents had less than an hour's notice of the flight. Academy graduates were sworn into their new roles in small groups. Outgoing University of Maryland President Wallace Lowe presided over a virtual commencement today, featuring an address from Maryland graduate and House of Representatives Majority Leader Steny Hoyer. Even though it was a virtual event, graduating seniors were given the traditional cap and tassel. 
Graduates at all levels have been deprived of the normal celebration, but a farm equipment company in Jarrettsville repurposed its machinery to pay tribute to the class of 2020. These students are among the graduates of North Harford High School. In Frederick County, Urbana High School had an adopt a senior program. Seniors were showered with baskets of treats along with balloons and signs to try to compensate for the loss of normal end of year traditions. The school held a modified graduation ceremony. In the whole scheme of things, Urbana and the community, what they did was awesome. It's special to know that we're, we're strong and we went through this. Election day, just about a week and a half away and things will be very different this year. Joining us is Nikki Charlson, who is the Deputy Administrator of the State Board of Elections. Uh, Ms. Charlson, the, the main thing is very limited in-person uh, voting because of the pandemic. That's right. Uh, the governor changed the way we're conducting this election to a vote by mail. This was at the recommendation of the State Board and adopted after lots of discussions about what's the safest way to provide the opportunity to vote while keeping people as safe as possible. And so it is primarily a vote by mail election, which means uh, we've mailed ballots to over 3.5 million eligible voters um, and asked that if a voter can return his or her ballot to do so, either return it by mail or there are ballot drop off locations around the state to you can drop them right into a bin that's getting collected by election officials. There will be, as you said, limited in-person voting for those voters that maybe couldn't return the ballot, or didn't get a ballot, want to take advantage of the same day registration process. Um, but that's how we're trying to provide an election in the safest possible way. And the, I'm guessing the decision on how to uh, staff and, and operate a, a local polling place in the safest way would be up to the, the local county boards. If the local boards of elections um, are the, the um, individuals responsible for putting the polling places or the vote centers together and staffing them, but we are supporting them with procuring uh, masks and sanitizer and gloves and face shields and all the things to keep the poll workers and the voters as safe as possible. The contractor had a, a delay in mailing Baltimore City ballots. Uh, but it, at this point, uh, by the time our program airs Friday night, everybody should have them, would you say? Yes, it does look like a vast majority of Baltimore City voters have already received their ballots. They came in their mailboxes this week. There might be a few left over for delivery Saturday, um, but they were later than scheduled. But it does appear that most voters in Baltimore City will have them uh, Friday or Saturday. All right, let's 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 review for a second what everybody's supposed to do, because I've never voted absentee before. Uh, this packet showed up in the mail a day or two ago. Big envelope, lots of writing on the back. Quickly review what's inside here. Uh, there are instructions. There's a list of where the, uh, the local voting places are. Um, there's a form I hadn't seen before, which is a certification of a person assisting an absentee voter, basically that you're not uh, exercising any undue influence. Correct. And then there is the ballot itself, which in my case is an independent or unaffiliated voter is a, uh, a lot of white paper. And then on the front, the local school board uh, race. So actually, I don't think I've ever been able to do this on television before. I can complete my ballot by filling in, I'm supposed to vote for one and fill in the little circle and I'm done. So all I have to do is put it in this envelope, which is uh, postage paid, and That's I right. sign the back. And talk about that for a second, because whoever opens this is going to basically know how I voted in this very important school board race, right? So before we... Before I answer that, I think I just want to emphasize for viewers the importance of signing that oath. Um, if it's not signed um, and we don't get a signed oath um, before the election's over, the ballot won't count. So signing that oath is super important. The, the oath, you mean the what it says on the back of the envelope? Correct. Not the Correct. assisting... Uh, the assist Correct. No. Right. Okay. The oath that's printed on the back of the envelope must be signed. Otherwise, the ballot won't count. But to your point of you have your signature and your ballot inside, 
the process at the local board of elections is that they'll check to make sure that your ballot was timely received, which is looking at the postmark um, and looking at to see that it's signed. Once it meets those two criteria, they open the envelope and then immediately remove the ballot from the envelope. So at that point, your ballot and your envelope are no longer associated with each other. And so the secrecy of the ballot is preserved. What does this mean for tabulating results on election night? Baltimore City has uh, some hotly contested municipal races, Democratic primary. Um, will the results be known more quickly or, or most of the results may come in more quickly? Is that right? So starting today, the local boards of elections are authorized to start counting those ballots. So the ballots that they've received, they're authorized to start counting them through election day. Uh, the results are obviously embargoed until after 8 p.m. on June 2nd. So there'll be two sets of results election night. There will be the results from counting the vote by mail ballots released shortly after eight o'clock. And then later in the night, the in-person results will be received. And then the local boards will continue to count ballots through um, June 10th or June 12th, 10 days after election day. Uh, so we won't know, we never know until 10 days later, but this time around, of course, we don't know how many ballots are gonna come in the day after election day and the day after that. So there will be two sets of results. Um, it will just depend on how many more ballots are left to count. And before we go, the important thing is, uh, obviously everybody should vote, everybody can vote, whether you got one in the mail or didn't. If you didn't, uh, if you did get one, you gotta mail it by the deadline, uh, get a postmarked on, on Tuesday. That's right. Second. And if you didn't receive one and you should have, or you need to register at the last minute, you need to go in person. That's right. We do have um, next week, we can still deliver ballots to voters. So if somebody didn't get a ballot to call either the local board of elections or the state board of elections, it will get you a replacement ballot in the mail. But if you don't have one still by June 2nd, then in-person voting is the way uh, to go. And we will try to make that process as safe as possible. Nikki Charlson, uh, Deputy Administrator of the State Board of Elections. Thank you very much. Thank you. A new poll commissioned by WYPR Radio, the Baltimore Sun, and the University of Baltimore finds a tight race for mayor of Baltimore. Sheila Dixon and Mary Miller, both with 18% support. Trailing, but within the 5% margin of error, was Brandon Scott. Also registering support were Thiru Vignaraja, TJ Smith, and incumbent Jack Young. Continuing with our interviews of the candidates, here's Charles Robinson. Mayor Dixon, let's begin with, um, this isn't the first time you've run for this office. Why this time? Well, no, it is not the first time I ran for this office. And this time, probably more so than in 16, it is so crucial. It's crucial because of, for the last five, six, seven years, instead of us seeing the city turn around and crime going down and city services being provided in a quality manner where people understand that we work for people that work in city government work for the taxpayers if you look at what's going on in our schools and the fact that you know in some reports the schools have gotten more money than they've ever had you know that we're like the third top um funded school system in the country but our kids are still falling behind and we're not seeing the kind of progress as well as you know, trying to bring together not only our young people, but um, our many businesses and, and nonprofits, et cetera, um, to really kind of sit down and have conversations beyond just talking about the problem, but really strategically coming up with ways to systemically you know, affect changes for the future. This is in a unique race. First of all, it's going to be by mail, mail in ballot. But I note that there are a number of people who are yeah. running for this office. And I'm wondering, what does that say about the city in general, i.e., you know, people believe that they have the tools to, to kind of run a, a major operation. This is not small potatoes, and I know you know this. You know, uh, it's a multi-million <laughs> million dollar industry. If you I mean, I believe every candidate is very genuine and sincere about wanting to be mayor, but 
but do they have the ability to juggle multiple things at one time? Is Do we have time for a learning curve in some cases? Because some people have this idea or ideas about how to run city government and have no clue about what it's going to take because they have not been within city government. And then some that are there, you know, sometimes it's difficult to focus on multiple things at one time. And you have to realize your strength and your weaknesses and how, if you have the capacity and the ability to manage and, and to bring people to the table and to work um, within the community and do all those things at one time. You can't focus on one thing. And, and there's many things you have to focus on at one time and you have to do it in an effective and a, in a manner that bring about real results. And you have to be truthful, transparent. You have to be honest. You know, you can look at some of the commercials that we have out. Um, nobody's water bill has been cut off in multi, in many years. So nobody's water bill is going to get cut off. I mean, so, you know, pe people, you know, everybody's going to sell themselves. Talk a little bit about how campaigning is different in this current environment. Um, the fact that um, we have to, you know, wear masks and as well as, you know, we do food drives on the weekend to really help communities all over the city and we donate our money to do this. You know, the Merrill Mondays, the purpose of those and Thursdays as well, it was to inform people. What do you do the first couple of things? That One of the first things that I would do is sit down with the commissioner, share with him my thoughts and ideas in reference to where I think we need to move, even despite having the consent decree, um, along with creating a, um, a COVID-19 task force within the health department. All of our candidate interviews can be found at mpt.org slash state circle. Thanks for watching and we hope you have a safe holiday weekend. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities. Programs on MPT are made possible by our members and the following. Discover an active, vibrant, connected community full of inquisitive individuals who've been learning all their life and have no plans on stopping now. Roland Park Place, Metropolitan Senior Living in the heart of Northern Baltimore City, featuring the grand expansion opening summer 2021. Learn more at 410-261-4646 or visit rolandparkplace.org. Vote safe. Vote by mail. It's easy, free, and secure. You don't need to request a ballot. Eligible voters will automatically receive a ballot at the address we have on file. Follow the instructions to fill out your ballot. It is dated April 28th, but still valid. Ballots must be postmarked or placed in a voting drop box by 8 p.m. on June 2nd. You do not need a stamp. For information about voter registration, in-person voting,